Good morning, PASW clients and staff, friends joining us. Welcome to Monday's class. Hope you guys had a nice, restful weekend, and I hope you're ready to get started uh, with some good work I have cut out for us this week. Um, so last Monday, we talked about Amadeus, right? We talked about Mozart, and I hope you guys thought about what your oboe is or uh, in life. What's the thing that drives you that makes life worth living? So I hope uh, I did get some personal comments, so that was nice. But uh, if you want to write them in, in the YouTube comments, that, that'd be great too. And you know what, if it's something that you need more time to think about, perhaps it takes a lifetime to think of what um, really it makes life worth living sometimes, or what's, or maybe it goes through different, different oboes. Any, anyway, um, so that was, that was Mozart. So now we're going to go a few years later, um, m a little bit move forward into uh, Beethoven. Yes, it's inevitable that we would get to Beethoven. And um, so Beethoven was born in 1770. Um, so he's alive for about 20 years while Mozart's alive. But um, th there's no evidence that, that says that either, either of them met. I know, um, obviously, Beethoven uh, was hugely influenced by Mozart and by Haydn and Bach, of course, other composers before him. But... Um, Beethoven's interesting. He's, um, again, you know, I, I'm trying to um, bring light to some of these very dark stories and people that had very dark lives. Um, not bring light to it, but not, not you know, um, uh, dwell on it. But uh, Beethoven was a, tr a very troubled person, probably to say the least. It's, it's um, and there there's always talk of, you know, does suffering always, you know, make the artist better or... Um, there's always that kind of theory going around, but we'll talk about Beethoven. Obviously, we all know he's a genius and he's a composer, but let's let's talk about some other elements of uh, that might be more interesting rather than just kind of listing off, you know, facts as a childhood prodigy. Um, and uh, let's just go through this together. You know, I mean, um, it, it took me a while to understand Beethoven. I, I'm, I, I'll be the first to admit that I, I never, I never liked Beethoven that much. I knew of his greatest works. I knew of Ode to Joy. And that's genius. I knew Moonlight Sonata. Genius. Um, I knew Beethoven's fifth. Genius. Uh, I knew Fur Elise. a prodigy and had several brothers and his father was an alcoholic and would beat him when he would play the wrong notes as he was practicing um, piano or keyboard and um, he hated his father and um, but started making money pretty early on around 18 he was he was making money for the whole family as a as a musician as somebody that would improvise um, on the piano and uh, it's funny because when I when I mentioned to Mozart in, in Mozart's thing that the piano was kind of becoming a little bit more of a mainstream instrument, um, obviously Mozart had piano concertos, but you know the harpsichord, clavichord, all these other keyboard things. Beethoven was one of the first composers to really utilize the the solely the piano as his instrument for composition and for concertos and for sonatas. Obviously the famous Moonlight Sonata, which was not ever called the Moonlight Sonata. It was attributed after his death. It was simply just Piano Sonata Number 14, um, 
but you know that doesn't sell as many tickets it's a little bit more romantic and he wrote it for uh, a woman uh, he didn't have a great great love life never married never had any kids um, was in love with many many women that didn't reciprocate or didn't didn't work out or you know something like that or didn't um, phone was disconnected or something like that so as he's as he's already making a really you know a pretty good salary living as a composer he begins losing his hearing in his 20s and we all know that um, Beethoven was deaf now obviously he wasn't born deaf but uh, in his 20s he starts losing his hearing and um, there's some mystery about how that happened was it uh, and the consensus of what what I've sort of discovered is that it was it was probably lead poisoning. Um, now, when he died, somebody somebody took a lock of his hair, pretty substantial lock. They actually they cut it off him uh, when off his dead body, and it's uh, it sold for thirty five thousand uh, pounds, I think, a year ago or something like that. But because of that, it 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 opened up a lot of. Um, insight into Beethoven's DNA and because of this hair they, they think that there there might have been lead poisoning is the is the lead um, role in, into the cause of his hearing loss so once Beethoven's 45 he's completely deaf so um, this is the last 11 years of his life so when you think of that what's the irony of what God would give somebody. What's what's the most important thing for a composer? It's ears, right? And to take that away is is horrible. What's what's the worst that for a painter? His eyes, right? Not seeing something. Yet, um, because of Beethoven's training and brilliance, genius helps too. But because of his training, perfect pitch, and all those years of writing, uh, he could hear the music in his head. So it wasn't. He knew how it sounded. Now that's not justification for okay. Well, that's 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 just good. That's good enough for him then, right? No, it's it's you know it must have been devastating, and also um, we hear we hear a sense of of anger, and whether it's anger toward him, toward God, if he believed in God, toward society of some sort of, um, and rightly so. I mean, who wouldn't be outraged that? Why, why am I going? Why am I going deaf when he had all these other ailments too? You know, um, the list was so long I didn't even want to uh, say it because it's just ridiculous. I mean, he was just a sickly. I mean, people back then were, but he was just a very sickly person. And then to throw this deafness on top of it, of course you're you're going to be mad at life. I mean, that's just that's just human nature to be. And so. From the, his early piano sonatas and symphonies toward the end of his life, his pieces become darker. Now, darker doesn't always mean better, but I think you know when if we look at look at some of the pieces from the beginning to the end, there's 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 something more that we can uncover. So it was really the string quartets, and particularly the late string quartets of Beethoven that I fell in love with. That I um, I, I I started not understanding but I was intrigued and wanting to to learn more about him and particularly when I when I came ac across his famous fugue which was way too far out there that his publisher said it cannot go into the um, into the string quartet as a movement it's got to be separate no one's gonna no one's gonna buy that I mean they must have thought he was crazy when he wrote this thing um, and he was deaf and and you know so they probably thought he, he you know, this was these were all mistakes. Um, it's considered one of the greatest pieces today. That his great fugue. It's, it's the great fugue. It's called. But, but let's let's back up a little bit. Um, so if he's completely deaf in his 40s, how you know how long can you keep up that charade of pretending that you're not deaf to people that are going to hire you to give you money? 
How, how often can you can you make that work? I mean, it's just it's really it's horrible because um, uh, and so he would have to start giving up public, you know, performing in public, and he would only see select friends, and he would mostly start communicating in notebooks, which we have today, and. Um, I think he was probably already introverted, but then this deaf, deafness really forced him to probably become insular and very, very, even more private. So there were probably so many times when Beethoven wanted to give up because of this disability. Um, and I mean, what could be more, you know, uh, appropriate for us to be talking about? Um, a, a performer with a disability with um, this increasing deafness um, and what what I want to um, talk to you about is something very very important that what Beethoven did and it's called the Helgenstadt Testament okay um, Helgenstadt's not there anymore it's uh, Vienna T today it's a part of Vienna but it's it was a letter written by Beethoven to his brothers Carl and Johann and um, uh, in 1802. So this is this is about 20 years before he, he dies. He dies at 56, which is young now, but it was that's probably, you know, for his chronic uh, illnesses, that probably wasn't that young. But um, he writes this um, Helgenstadt Testament, and in it, he really, um, and he didn't send the letter ever. Um, it, it it stayed with him until he died. Um, it was found in his papers after his death in, in 1827. And um, he dies in, uh, yeah, in 18, after his death. So what he says in this is, is kind of this confession. And, um, and he says, I would have ended my life. It was only my art that held me back. And it seemed to me impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt was within me. What do you think about that? He was, he was going to kill himself, but he had, he had more work to do. Something in him, it, his will, a higher power, something in him said, there's more work to be done and I have to give it to the world. Now you could say, well, that's the huge ego and you'd be right. He probably did have a huge ego, but guess what? Guess what? We're talking about him today. He did have a lot of work to do, and that work is something that we're listening to and enjoying and talking about on this beautiful sunny day right now. We're still, hundreds of years later, we're still talking about him. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, um, there's some will, and I, we see it in you guys and the clients, the staff does, um, that, that you guys keep moving on there's not you can't give up there's no i know that sounds corny but there's something in you guys in all of us that tells us we just we have to stay with this game we have to stay in this somehow we got to do it we and and you you wake up you show up you go to work you practice you do these things even when you don't want to do them and what that's whether you have a disability whether you don't have one um so the fact that this Helgenstadt, this letter, which, which, he never, which he never sent to anybody, was this confession and this vulnerability and this sort of promise to his brothers and to the world that there's work for me to be done here. Truly remarkable and, and heartbreaking. So isn't there work for all of us to be done here? Aren't we, isn't there work for us to do now? It's, it's, it was only my art that held me back. It seemed to me impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt was within me. Pretty, I, I, I'm, I'm stunned. I still can't, uh, I think it's so beautiful. So we have a lot of work to do in our lives. And that art, whether it be composing, painting, writing, talking to somebody that needs to listen, to someone to listen to, helping somebody on the street, being kind to somebody. It, all of those are, are, are in some ways motions of art. Let it be that that is why life, life is work, why we have work to do here. 
but we need to keep doing good work here. So what a genius he was. And um, thank you for listening. So let's keep that in mind. What work do we have left? We have a lot of work to do here. Okay. Love you guys. See you tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. I forgot to give you your homework assignment for the week. After all that beautiful Beethoven and all that emotion, I, I, it slipped my mind. Yes, I'm sorry, but there's homework. We're going to do another film scoring project because uh, you guys did so great on the last one. I was so proud of you. Uh, so, And I, I think this scene will be very, very fun. So um, I want you to do the same thing. Find a piece of music or create something original and put it to the scene. Uh, if you can just give me, tell me on the link below the video, this video, um, or you can email it to me, whatever's best. Um, and then if there's a particular section, just tell me, you know, I want this to start at three minutes and 50 seconds or something like that. And I'd be happy to embed the audio and marry it to the picture for you because uh, I think these are very fun, very cool to, um, to do. So, um, let um, take a look at this scene right now and uh, then we'll talk about it. So that scene is from the very famous The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, directed by Sergio Leone, and this is 1966. And uh, obviously I've taken the music out. I don't know where it begins. I don't know where it starts, where it ends. I mean, I do know, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so a lot of long shots, a lot of close-ups, a lot of tension, violence, gunfights. There's So um, I want you guys to come up with something. It can be funny. It can be you know, anything, but make it, make it, um, you know, take it seriously, you know, it's like with the uh, saber dances of Cachatorian, that was funny, but, uh, you know, they could have been going to a circus in the desert, so, yeah, so take it seriously, but it, there's no right or wrong answer, so, um, come back and look at this, I'll see if I can upload just this, I'm sure I can, to YouTube, just so you have reference of, uh, this, but this is obviously the movie stripped uh, without the soundtrack. So I want you to put in the soundtrack for Friday, and so do it. Start today or you know this week, and send them to me um, by Thursday, the latest, the latest. Um, 
and I'll, I'll put it up and we'll see the results on Friday. Okay. All right. Um, good luck. Can't wait to see what you come up with. Bye.